Martin, big thank you for welcome to Startup Grind and big thank you for being here. It is wonderful to be back, Jens. Thank you so much for making this happen. And it is so nice to be back talking to the Startup Grind family after a couple of years. Yeah, I saw your LinkedIn post that you did an event in Beijing that had a, quite a lot of people coming in. Yeah, well, it's, it's amazing. My, my biggest audience is a Startup Grind audience. And I knew the community in Beijing, uh, really amazing Yelps and the team, just incredible. And they booked me for an event and I walked up to the university building and I saw this huge queue of people outside. And I, my first thought was, who else is who else is presenting tonight? And then I get to the door and then I see my face in this huge queue of people. And there's like over 500 people. And I was just like, oh, wow, this is cool. And uh, it, was a lot, it was probably the most fun I've had presenting because talking to such a big audience of engaged people who you know are really interested in, basically have a growth mindset. And when you're talking to a growth mindset audience, which is what the startup grind is, you just know it's going to be fun. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to this. Yeah, and, 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 so, and we, for all of you out there, I mean, we are now online and we're still online in Hong Kong, but doing those in-person events, that's really gives you that extra kick. So Martin, we alluded to, you've been in Beijing, so maybe you can make a short introduction of yourself. Yep, so I trained as a graphic designer. Um, I graduated in 1999, uh, which means I'm a little bit older than maybe some people here, or maybe the same age. And um, I worked for four years in London as a graphic designer doing educational game design. Then I got the opportunity to move to Beijing and I worked as a graphic design lecturer for two years. And as anyone in Asia knows that the opportunities are just very plentiful. And I suddenly found a two year contract teaching design turned into 16 years of my life. Uh, I got married, fell in love, have children, have a flat, have a business. And then we came back to the UK for one month at the end of 2019, Christmas, New Year, children's birthdays, and we're still here. And that's mm. our good story that we have been um, prevented from traveling back to China. But the silver lining is that we're spending a lot of time with my parents and just dealing with the disruption that everyone else is going through. So. And then you have the company called, uh, which I really love the name, Eight Seconds to connect. So did you have that already in Beijing or is it something you set up in the UK? It was the UK. So basically in China, I have a company called Mountains of Imagination and Chinese with my terrible pronunciation is Chuang Xiang Rushan. And that was how I positioned myself in China. And then when I got to the UK and I had that break and that moment, that distance to, to sort of reflect, I realized that that was talking about me and I need to talk about you. And so my old business said, I have lots of, I have mountains of imagination. And clients are kind of like, well, I don't know if I want mountains of imagination. And so I realized it was the opportunity to sort of say, no, it's all about you, the audience, you, my customers, and the people that I help. And you have eight seconds to connect and I can make that happen. And so if you want to connect really quickly, then let's have a, let's start our conversations. Mm. Now, I, I think it, it's really smart because it's like, you know, we say that, the, the amount of time that we have in front of somebody or in front of an audience before they start to pick up their phones or, or think about other stuff. So today we are here to look at sort of pitching and how to get your message across. And we're gonna look at it in two stages. One is sort of the preparing part. How do I take my ideas and thoughts and mountains of inspiration? And the other one is the performing part basically being there on stage, be it 550 or 500 people. So let's start with the preparing part. Um, and you said you moved to, to, to China in 99 and I moved to Hong Kong in 98. And before all these startups happened, we always did presentations. So the first question I would like to set, sort of set aside is, what's the difference between a pitch and a presentation? That's a good way. That's a really good place to start. In my world, in my universe, in the universe I create for my clients is that a pitch is short and quick and a presentation has more, more time. So a real quick example, a, a TED talk is more like a presentation because you're not on the clock and you have 
the audience is saying, I'm going to give you eight minutes, 12 minutes, 16 minutes of my attention. And you, I know that Ted has filtered you to be good. So therefore, it's going to be entertaining. Or you go to a lecture at university and you have a, a, an hour with a professor. That's more of a presentation. Whereas a pitch is like the opposite. I do not have your attention guaranteed. I need to earn it. And if, if, if anyone knows Wallace and Gromit, the, the, the animation, there's, there's one scene in Wallace and Gromit where uh, the dog Gromit is putting train tracks in front of a train, just enough time that the train keeps going. That's basically a pitch. You are, you are earning the attention of your audience by what you say and how they see themselves in what you're saying. And at any moment during a pitch, they can pick up their phone and just disconnect. And so the pitch is all about, I respect your, your, I respect your attention. I'm going to share something valuable for you. And you're going to keep in this moment with me until this pitch turns into a conversation. Mm. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah, because as you said, if you go to a lecture, you're, you are committed. You go to a movie, you're committed. If you go to a pitch, it's often, as they often name it, like the pitch competition or, or so on. So the next step is, how do you get your ideas from your head into a pitch? Um, the best way to start is super simple. And the worst place to start is by opening your computer, choosing a piece of software and starting in the train of thought that some software wants you to go through, whether it's Keynote, PowerPoint, Prezi, Google Slides, pitch.com, whatever, whatever the software is, that is the tool. And that is the biggest mistake I see people jumping into the slide. They open it, three bullet points, what do you want to say? That's not how you think creatively. Creative thinking is a whiteboard, post-it notes, going for a walk, getting a piece of paper and a pen, maybe grabbing your phone, pressing record, and just speaking your ideas and letting your phone capture them and then get them to be transcribed or something like that. The best way to start organizing your thinking is where there's no box or frame or pressure that is digital, but that box, whether it's a whiteboard or a piece of paper, is free and analog so that you can really think with no limits. That's how you really start a great pitch. Mm. And yeah, so the, the the free flow of it, and and so as you said, capture any moment that you have, use the recorder and so on. Now we also know that there is the one minute pitch, the three minute pitch, and and sort of the twenty minute pitch, and and the the shorter one might be done from stage at at the pitch competition, and the other one might be done in a boardroom when you have been invited by somebody or a team of people. So how do you structure a one minute or three minute pitch or a 20 minute pitch? What's the difference? Um, the way that I like to think about it is to understand that they, they go through transformation. And so if we imagine a caterpillar crawls along leaves, eating, 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 soon the caterpillar will become a butterfly and start flying around, be colorful and, and flowing and energetic. And that one minute pitch is your caterpillar. Your 10, 20 minute pitch is your butterfly. <clears throat> they are not the same thing. They transform one into the other. And that, that opening time, first contact with people is all about being memorable, being interesting, and starting to build that relationship bridge and earning that three minute pitch which then earns your 20 minute pitch. And so a caterpillar cannot become a butterfly in three minutes. It has a life cycle and the life cycle of your pitch needs to be very well structured. And I, I love talking in metaphors, so I'm gonna switch metaphors now. And I want you to imagine the airport. We've all been at the airport and we've all been checking in with our luggage and we've all seen somebody sitting on a suitcase, struggling to close the zip of their suitcase, stuffing it down, like the look of panic on their face as their clothes are spilling out of the suitcase and they're forcing the zip and then they have to go and get it wrapped up in plastic. Don't be that person with your pitch. 
don't put a 10 minutes worth of content into 30 seconds of attention because your audience will just go, wow, that was horrible. Know that you're in a 30 second pitch. You're at the caterpillar stage and you have to transform into that butterfly and just go slow and just choose the most relevant information for your audience that's going to make them nod, smile and ask a question and then you know your pitch is working. Mm. Yeah, and then you get that that invitation for that next meeting, and that's as you said, that's when you that's when you fly. Uh, there's no you have to think of what is the goal with what I'm doing right now, and sort of what's the next step. Absolutely. When you're putting together um, the material, I mean, as you said, you can you can be tempted to fill the slides with loads of text because you want to you want to show that you know so much. How do you build trust? That comes when people can see themselves in the content. And I remember when I was in Beijing and we were working for um, a branded content company and we sent out a request for a pitch and we got three pitches in from three different um, people. And my job was to get the pitches in and then to show them to the board of directors of the company. And I remember specifically that I had my laptop open, we had a meeting room and the, and the audience knew that they were looking at some pitches for this project. So the context was super clear. And I start going through the presentation and by the second slide, the two board of directors looked at each other and said, why are we looking at templates? Why are we looking at the same stuff that everybody else gets? And they literally disengaged and they just started talking about what they really wanted to achieve through this pitch and I was sat there just pressing spacebar on this laptop and the slides were moving forward no one was paying any attention and I was sat there ringside it was like being the ringside seat of a boxing match and just watching somebody get KO'd and I was just like wow this if you if your audience doesn't see themselves in the in your message boom they're off and getting the audience to sit in front of your content is the expensive bit the meetings, the scheduling, the, the 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 setup, the the attention. Once you're there, you've done the hard work. And so really put them at the center of your message. Put yourselves, you know, how how can I get two stones and spark them so that their imagination is starting to turn into a fire? Then then we're in a good space. Yeah, and, and when it comes to also building trust. I mean, the the the, the one minute, the three minute, the, the twenty minute. It is the start of the journey because when we are talking about pitching now to get investment, and that's a five year journey. I mean, you're going to work together, so you have to do anything and everything you can to to get the 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 trust of the other party because it's it's not that they are going to buy a product. It's not a sales presentation. It's a the pitch about and. Coming to that point, uh, when you have at the end of a pitch, um, so what's the difference between a call to action and an ask? The call to the ask is super specific on what I want from you. And in a lot of fundraising contexts, there's obviously a power dynamic between somebody who has the idea, somebody who has the resources. So the people with the idea have made a incredibly concrete case for why an injection of resources will allow them to grow. And so the ask needs to be specific, simple, and the beginning of that next conversation. And also there's a, there's a fantastic breakdown. There's um, somebody in the UK called Anthony Rose, who's got a, product, a company called Seed Legals. And I listened to him on a podcast and he talks about four different investor archetypes that he's noticed. And one of them he described as being the spread spreadsheet guru. Somebody who can look at a spreadsheet and literally is just deconstructing it in their mind. Uh, very good with numbers, very good at seeing how it all going to play out. And your ask needs to be in that universe of the spreadsheet guru. Somebody that enjoys the narrative of numbers and enjoys the stories that numbers can tell us. And it has to be simple, 
and clear and trust building. This is where a big element of that trust we were talking about gets built. So that's my ask. A call to action is more like, what are we gonna do next? Are you gonna go and connect with me on LinkedIn? Are you gonna tell somebody about me? Are you gonna go and think about something? Are you gonna buy my book? Are you gonna watch a movie? Like I want to set up the next step with as little friction as possible so that this moment we have together on a call or a pitch or a conversation moves somewhere else. And the ask is very specific. It goes into a money conversation. The call to action is wherever essentially you want someone to go through your funnel next. What is the next level down on that funnel? And that's a funnel in a good way, not necessarily like a squeezing funnel, but a logical funnel. Yeah, and, and talking about the call to action, it could be good to try to think through how that funnel could potentially be. When it comes to meeting investors or or clients um, and when you have the first pitch that's going to be the first time but still trying to think into the future what would I like people to do next and how many call to action interactions can I take I mean resource wise etc exactly now now we talked about the preparation um, and you have this uh, material in front of you how do you practice to pitch it's really unsexy and it's really unglamorous, but it's timeless advice. It's just practice and preparation and defending your focus. So let's talk about how we got on this call today. Jens is incredibly good at making sure all the information is in my inbox 24 hours before that we had a prep session. We checked the technology. We did everything we could to make this moment seamless. That's preparation. And when I was at art school, we did screen printing. And I remember the professor saying it's 95% preparation. Don't rush your preparation because if you rush your preparation, you'll screw it up, you'll waste loads of time and your print will look like garbage. And it's the same with pitching. It's like you need to really make it important to, to protect the time and, and put a wall around your attention before you pitch. So switch off your phone, no social media, nothing that an algorithm can tell you right now is gonna improve your pitch. That's what you can do to defend your environment. And then you need to sort of make sure that your mind is excited, that you are anticipating this moment, that you're not feeling anxious, that you're feeling this is gonna be great. It might not be perfect, but perfect doesn't actually exist. But it's going to be amazing and I have the attention of how many people right now? We've got almost 20 people right now. This is a huge audience, very valuable moment. So be excited for that. And that's how you control your mind. And then your mind is linked to your body. And the one, two things I want everyone to do when they present next is to stand up. We're both standing up now. So we are standing in a performance posture. We're not sitting in the posture of writing emails, we're standing and breathing because your, 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 your lungs is the engine room of your body. And if your body feels relaxed, your mind can feel excited. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and yes, as you said, we are both standing and it, it's really good for your back as well to stand and work. Uh, but the practice, to be able to practice and practice and, and uh, yeah, record yourself and watch back and you know uh I, I, some people don't like to listen to themselves uh i kind of sort of came part that, by that point at some point it's like yeah it's just it's it's just looking at yourself and say okay can i do less of that or more of this and so on so practice but but also on the practice you also running the pitch club on linkedin so there is a way of meeting up with people to practice absolutely so we run pitch club which is uh, twice a week, a community where people can come and practice this moment. What does it feel like? How do I get set up? How do I, how do I sound? How do I look? And so Pitch Club is designed to be a ground floor pitching event with the doors are wide open. Anybody can come and pitch. You get your name on the list, you can pitch. The audience is completely very diverse intentionally. And the way that I talk about it is imagine 
pitching to an investor is running a marathon. You can't just turn up and run the marathon. You have to practice. You have to go on jogs. You start two miles, five miles, 12 miles, half a marathon, full marathon. Pitch club is that Sunday morning five mile run around the park. You meet up with a bunch of people. Hey, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. Let's run. It's going to take me an hour. I'm going to learn something. I'm going to perform. I'm going to get better. And then I'm going to come back next week or the two weeks later. And what we've seen is, again, we've seen incredible caterpillar to butterfly transformations. People who turn up on their first pitch and totally choke. Oh, they can't speak. They run off. They disappear. They feel super nervous. Five pitches later, different person. Ten pitches later, different person. And what we want is that community where, very much like Startup Grind, it's about the support. And we don't quite have our values as well established as the values for Startup Grind. But basically, again, it's like give before you take. You know, make those connections that aren't just a list of faces, but actually people you know. And what was the first one again? I forget. What's the first value? Well, to to give not take, to make friends, not contact, and yeah, so that's um, <laughs> to yeah give first. Um, um, yeah, and, and and I think that those are good things. I mean, at those pitch club events, you if if you're we're gonna share the link to the pitch club event in the follow up email to make sure that everybody makes knows where to sign up, uh, but. Um, I haven't pitched at Pitch Club, but I'm happy to listen and I'm also happy to give feedback. Um, so you can also learn from listening to others and others' feedback. So I think it's a great way of, of getting that 360 perspective on, on pitching and uh, also taking the stage. Your, and your feedback, Jens, is particularly interesting because it comes from your perspective and it's within the startup grind community and whenever you give feedback I'm like that's a voice we don't often get because it is within the framework of of startups so a lot of the people are coaches community builders professionals students and that's the, the beauty is its diversity and then having these strong voices from certain communities makes it you, you just learn through observation which is really powerful yeah yeah and it's twice a week yeah. so let's move on from preparing now we've done the practice to performing so who sh who from your company should be pitching it's that's that's a really good one it's about the person that has the most authenticity for that part of the story so i remember we did a um an accelerator event in beijing in 2015 and I went along just to watch the pitching and by accident, I ended up becoming a team leader and we spent Friday night, we pitched Saturday, Sunday, we built our MVP and then Sunday night we pitched. And my goal was to get everybody's voice in our nine minute pitch. So I did the intro and then I sliced up the content and said, okay, you talk about marketing, you talk about tech, you talk about um, user acquisition, you talk about growth. And everybody in our team had a had a chance to to perform because I was like, if you've just spent whole Saturday and Sunday and I get to do all the talking, that's not fair for you. And we were the only team out of six where it was a team pitch. The other ones were like, I'm the paper CEO after two days and I'm going to talk at you for eight and a half minutes and then I'm going to let my team step forward and say hello. I was like, if I was in that team, I would be really annoyed. But I didn't get a platform to have visibility. And I think that when a team is pitching and the leader sets the vision and then hands over to their trusted team person to say what they know about the subject and the audience is so impressed on a smooth handover because it, it, it not only shows the individual talent, it shows the team cohesion and then you're like, OK, this is a this is a great team because they know when to shut up. They know when to hand it over and they can trust and respect each other to be bigger than the individual parts. So a team effort when that expert is in their domain of expertise. Yeah, that's a really good point, because you can imagine if you're an investor looking at this and saying the handover on that stage was flawless, the handover of accounts 
would be the same, you know, within the company, so that people can take up different parts and and do their do their best thing. Exactly. Now, now um, there's a kind of I shouldn't say it for the next question. The the trick here is that why is the cover slide of the presentation extra important? This is such an under asked question. I really hope you ask lots more people this. Um, the cover slide is your book jacket. It is your album cover. It is your YouTube thumbnail. It is what is going to catch people's attention. It is the first time they see you and it is the movie poster. It's what starts the journey in the audience's imagination, sets the expectations. And, and it can often sit there for quite a long time because maybe the event organizer gets it up early, 10 minutes, and it's just sitting there. The audience is coming in. They might not have anything to look at. They're going to glance at it. If it's just a sort of super generic what, then there's nothing for the audience to look at. They'll grab their phones. And you can start pitching before you open your mouth with your cover page. And you can, there's a, there's a, a convention in storytelling called foreshadowing. And foreshadowing is when you hint at something that's about to happen. So often in a horror movie, somebody will sort of say something along, along the lines of, well, what's the worst that could happen, right? And then, you know, 20 minutes later, they're going to get they're going to be the first to go in this horror movie. They're foreshadowing. They're giving you a glimpse of the future. Use your cover page of your slide um, to. And, and I heard this on a on a YouTube video from some investors. They were like. You sh your audience should know what you do if they only see your first slide and you need a super succinct problem statement where you have in chalk drawn the outline of your idea super quick so if they walk up and leave at least they know what you do how you help people and what it looks like mm. and by having that on the first page you know you get those you can get extra minutes or extra seconds and that could be a sort of the deal breaker between a success and, and not so yeah use that as you said book cover the first slide exactly now how do you prepare before you go on stage? Prepare before is the breathing, lots of breathing, s telephone off and drink some water, go to the bathroom and find some way to raise your heart rate in a controlled way. Go for a walk in the garden, walk up and down some stairs, do some press ups, reach up, do some stretching, um, play with your children, do the washing up, do something which is active that is easy to stop and gets your mind in a f second gear because you the moment that you start your presentation, you want to be at fifth gear. You want to start fast. I call it starting like a sprinter. A lot of people will warm up in front of their audience. And again, you want to be ready to go. So five minutes before you're due to start speaking is when you that's when your presentation starts five minutes before because your head starts to get straight. You get excited, you get breathing, you go to the bathroom and you control everything that you can so that when they go and here's Martin that you go hello and you're ready to go and give yourself that margin in your it's a bit like setting a margin in your calendar to preparation time to get to the call. Yeah, that, that's the most powerful thing people can do. Yeah, and I also, as you said, I mean, if, if you look at from a physiological perspective, like you want blood flowing through your brain so that everything is going um, super well when you're coming on stage and, and you're full of, of that energy. Now you're walking up those steps. How do you capture your audience? The best piece of advice I got from Pitch Club was that um, Paulina said to me, she goes, Martin, I love your content, but I don't like you. You're not smiling. I was like, wow, OK, that was really uh, constructive and candid and useful. And I think about it all the time. And I realized that even after many years of pitching and presenting and lots of different contexts, there were still so some stages that made me feel nervous. And when I went nervous, I started to hyperventilate, even though I was working on my breathing. And I suddenly took a very serious expression. 
And there is so much to our non-verbal communication. And if somebody is there just straight, serious, stern, they look angry, they look vexed, and then the audience is like, oh, I don't know if I want to be with this person. So go the other way, big warm smile. Think about your kids, think about your loved ones, think about your heroes. Put a nice, authentic, genuine smile on your face. And people go, oh, this person's bringing some sunshine. I love it. I want to hear what they want to say. So it's that opening nonverbal cue. And there is an amazing book called Cues. I forget the author's name, but I will share it with you so we can put it in the newsletter. I, I listened to it recently. So much about what we don't say impacts how people perceive us. And that smile is just a quick win. And so I often have a photograph of my children just above my webcam, or even my kids will burst in on a call. And rather than try and push them away, I introduce them. It puts a smile on everyone's faces. They lose interest and off they go. So it's that smile that works. Mm. And, and really sort of sort of connecting with, with the audience. Um, now, imagine then that you are one of 10 pitches uh, over a, a, an evening. Um, how do you create an aha moment for your pitch? So an aha moment, I wrote this down once in a in a group workshop. It was when an investor said, tell me something that I tell me something that I wish I knew. That I that I should have gone. Oh, I should have known that. And that is an aha, aha moment. And I think it's like the ability to finish an idea for somebody or allow them to finish it for themselves so you're not over explaining but you're setting it up you're handing it over and in the mind of the audience they finish they finish it off and they go ah, get it now and it's it's that less is more that light touch that I'll, 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 i will do the hard work you do the finishing and then you're going to have what I call a stake of ownership in the idea. And I often sketch and in, in, in my book, um, O is for ownership on the A to, pitching A to Z. There's a little sketch of people taking a piece of pie. Everyone gets a piece of pie of the idea. And that is an aha moment because people own something. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and sort of, and I, I guess, you know, when you get it, you feel that the idea you saw the puzzle pieces and they all fell together in your own mind and it's like you then you also you have some some ownership of of that and uh, you feel oh I, yeah i got it it's like that's how it works exactly now pitching is a lot about we're not talking about sales pitching we're talking about investment pitching so how do you inspire somebody to invest one one thing i'm working with the founder at the moment and he has a list of about 25 contacts that he knows quite well, and he knows they have resources. And I had another piece of advice from somebody, and they said, when you wanna ask for money, ask for advice. And when you wanna ask for advice, ask for money. So do the opposite. I hope I said that right. And so working with this founder, we have uh, everything lined up. We've made the pitch deck, but at the beginning, the first slide, our opening slide is um, help me challenge my assumptions, stress test. So the first slide that the people see when they sit down and have this meeting is not sort of saying how we're going to change the world. It's sort of saying you're an expert. I want you to help me break this and fix it. And that, in a sense, we're hoping will disarm the audience to so we'll go, okay, you're not asking me for anything. You're asking me for my opinion and I can give you my opinion. And then by the end, what he's noticed is that by the end, most people have warmed up and sort of said, so I'm, I'm quite interested. How do we, you know, how do we take this to the next step? And it's not, it's not malicious or underhanded. It's just a different way of seeking permission to, you know, get them interested in what we defined as the ask versus the call to action. So the ask is actually, you know, four fifths of the way through the pitch, but it's not an ask to them, it's the ask. And then the call to action is, what do you think? How can we improve this? But they'll often double back and sort of say, well, I'm actually interested now. So it's, it's, it's not being needy, but it's asking for advice. 
is a mm. good way to do that. And and when you have had a number of these meetings and you got advice, then going back to that particular person you met, that investor, and say, hey, I implemented this now. Like that's also a great way of showing I listened. You said something. I listened. Here's the result. Then you get a chance for a new meeting. Absolutely. And they go, wow, they listened. Yes, exactly. And that's exactly what happened on this project that uh, the NED, who is very close to signing, has been looking at the pitch deck, go through its evolution. He and, and this is what we did. So we got he's a financial guy, spreadsheet guru, kind of kind of archetype. He sent us an email back and said, I think you should do this, 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 this. I took that email, stripped out all of the conversation, took his key points and turned it into a checklist in Google Docs. And we have been constantly referring back to that checklist throughout the process and sort of saying, have we answered his question here? I think we have. Have we answered his question? And, and I was like, he's given us a blueprint of how he sees this opportunity. If we ignore that to our own peril, it, something like that is gold. And then another example was a different person on the investor list said, I'm happy to have a meeting, but I want to see these three things. This is what I'm super interested in. So we answered those three things specifically in the first three slides so that when he sits down with the with the founder and they open up the slide deck, it literally says, you asked me to talk about this. Here it is. Hmm. He doesn't have to sit through six or seven minutes of context to get to the bit he cares about. And so I think it's like if somebody tells you what they're looking for, give them what they're looking for because they're like you're listening somebody's listening <laughs> it's really powerful <laughs> yeah and then people because they have many many meetings and people who actually listen to them it, it, it also feels um in your book you talk a little bit about how to avoid jargon on your own side as maybe being too technical but there's also the reverse to that so how do you handle questions from the investor in their jargon after your pitch yes that's that's a really good one um the way i like to think about it is there's this concept and it's not my concept it's by an amazing writer called randy olson and he was a marine biologist phd and then he became a hollywood documentary maker and he's written a fantastic book again i'll share the link with you it's called houston we have a narrative and it's all about how does technical subjects get become easier to explain and so he has a concept of the inner circle to the outer circle and a brain surgeon talking to a brain surgeon is inner circle to inner circle brain surgeon talking to martin is inner circle to far beyond the outer circle and when somebody brings you inner circle jargon is to simplify it where the audience is not doing the cognitive heavy lifting to understand what that means so simplify it like einstein said something along the lines of um everything should be as simple as possible without being simplified something along those lines um and so how can it be how can you agree on the same starting point because when somebody thinks they're here and somebody else thinks they're there you're going to have a massive miscommunication so yeah it's simply de-jargonify the jargon and ask is this how you see it and i think a question is a great way to clarify jargon mm. and, and also trying to i mean as you said the reason we sometimes use jargon is because it, it speeds things up and that's the reason for it is nothing to sort of trick somebody up it just happens but in the follow-up that we also send about this book called Venture Deals, where you can kind of read up on that jargon so that you, when you get a question, you get. Um, now, we prepare, we plan, we do everything. But how do you recover from a problem? <laughs> I call them banana skins. <laughs> um, the way you recover from a problem is you stop, you smile, you breathe, you acknowledge the problem. You try to fix it once. And if it doesn't get fixed easily, you go to plan B. And plan B is the same as plan A. I'm the pitch. You're the pitch. Your connection with the audience is the pitch. You don't need tech. You don't need slides. They help, but you can't. You should do this alone. 
Um, and the worst thing you can do is try and brush it under the carpet. And an audience is incredibly forgiving because they secretly admire you for being in the position they want. There's nothing better than being in the spotlight. And the audience is like, I'd love to be doing that. And when they see somebody wobble, they're like, oh, they're human, just like me. Oh my God. And that helps your audience get one step closer to doing this themselves. And so it happened to me three times in one year, the mid, mid of, middle of a presentation in the room live, my whole slides disappear. I think I forgot to plug my laptop in, maybe I kicked the uh, extension cable, maybe the projector broke, whatever. It happens, I looked at it and I was like, well, that wasn't supposed to happen. Took a sip of water, let the tension go out of the room. Hey, AV guys, can we fix this? All right, you're gonna fix this, I'm gonna keep going because I need to keep the momentum going. I kind of know what I was going to say. It might not be slide perfect, but who cares? And just use it as an opportunity to really connect with people. And then people are going to be like, wow, she really managed that super well. And like we said earlier, if she managed the wobble on stage, she's going to manage wobbles in everything else about her business. So it's actually a great demonstration of your depth of skill sets. Mm, yeah, and being able to as recover. I mean, you go into a meeting and didn't turn out the way you planned it to be. Um, now we already talked about the call to action to ask, but I'm going to ask the question again because the how do you end the pitch? The worst thing you should say is thank you because it has no momentum. You can say it at the beginning. Thank you for being here. You can say it two thirds of the way through. Thank you. This has been amazing. I cannot wait to finish on a high. And when you finish a pitch, it's like, here's how we could work together. Here's the ask. Here's my LinkedIn. Here's my book link. Here's the next event. Here's how we connect something simple, something actionable, something specific that because when, for example, when this call finishes, everyone's going to distribute back to their lives. And they're going to, I'm going to go and pick up some children. You're going to go and do this and that. I need to make sure that you either do it right now. So it's so super, super simple or that it's going to linger in your mind. You're not going to forget about it. And so, and it should be one thing. Because if you go to the bottom of a website and it says, go to my LinkedIn, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, TikTok, you're like, oh, it's too much. I'm not going to do anything. So it's like, and so when I talk to people, I'm only on LinkedIn. It's the only place I have social media attention. Of course, I use other platforms, but I don't talk about them. And I used to try and spread my call to actions everywhere. Be super specific because then that person will take the action. Yeah, and I think that, uh, you, as you said, to not be on too many social media platforms and that just makes it easier for people. I mean, LinkedIn is a great one. Um, now, as we said in the beginning, we, we're going to give away five copies of your book, Pitching AZ. And the idea here was that we now come to the Q&A part that people please uh, either copy your previous question and just paste it back in or write your new question and put in under that your LinkedIn connection so that we can keep track of who you are. And we'll give away those five books to um the first questions that comes in and for the rest of you we'll also send out a sort of a, a link uh, with a rebate code so you can get hold of it